بسم الله بسم الله بسم الله الله اكبر alright بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين I begin in the name of God, the most merciful, the most kind. And I praise God, the Lord and sustainer of all the worlds. And I greet you with a greeting of peace and mercy from your Lord. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> well, the first thing I want to do is thank the organizers. Because we come as participants and maybe we struggle with our tents or finding food, it's a bit nippy or this or that. But I don't think you can imagine the months of work that go into this. Every tiny detail, every detail on this stage, the metal, the speakers, the lectern, um, the different types of mic, I've chosen this one so I can move around. Um, the the drum kits, the tents, the toilets, the cleanup, the food, the cafe, the stalls, the speakers. So I'm just coming here and I'm giving a talk. This is the easy bit. And actually, the hard bit is done by brothers and sisters, and you may not know their names. But I'd like us to thank them and to give them a round of applause. So for ISB, thank you so much for bringing us together to live Islam. Right, well, I've just flown in from Australia. I was in Australia for, um, uh, for the past week. I got in, in uh, on Thursday, and I didn't have a voice yesterday, and uh, the only way I could speak was to go down very deep. I sounded like Barry White on a soul record. And um, I've been basically gargling and taking loads of stuff, and I was hoping that, please, once I get onto stage, the voice will come. So it's here, uh, alhamdulillah, may it, uh, may it last the length of the talk. The theme of the talk is connection lost. Now, you know, when you think about connections, the thing we think about is our mobile phones tends to be that thing which has become ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's attached to us. I'm like, when I can't find my mobile phone, I'm like, <gasps> And when I get all of my bars and they disappear, I get a little message. It says SOS in the top right-hand corner of my BlackBerry. It's like, save our souls, my connection is last. Uh, do you ever get that sense of panic? You're trying to get through to somebody and you can't, you're on the train and you can't get through. It's like, it's all right, mum, mum, uh, yeah, I'll speak to you. Yeah, I can't, okay, going through a tunnel, oh, bye. Um, connection lost. You can't have a conversation when the connection's lost. You can't tell someone something important when the connection's lost. You can't receive information when the connection's lost. But the thing with a mobile phone is you can't get any connection unless you have a contract. You've got to be with T-Mobile or Orange or Vodafone or whichever one you choose. Even if it's a pay-as-you-go contract or a monthly contract, you need a contract. And when we think about our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do we have connection with Him if we don't have a contract? And what is that contract? It begins, and it began a long time ago, before you were even born, before we came to this world, when we were souls, all together. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us, am I not your Lord? And we all replied, yes. We do testify. And that is the contract we made with him. He asked us, am I not your Lord? And we replied, yes, we do testify. Now you might say, well, look, I don't remember that contract. It's like T-Mobile starts sending you a bill and you're like, where'd this bill come from? I don't remember signing anything. But we have a contract in this world. Every time we say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, 
Every time we say our prayers and we testify, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. That is the contract. That is the contract that we made before we were even born. And we reaffirm it in this world. Now, people come up to me, they say, Sister Sarah, you're a convert to Islam. Or some of them say, no, no, you're a revert to Islam. Some of them say, no, convert, revert. You embraced Islam. You chose Islam. They say, that's really special. Because you chose to have your contract with God. You made that decision. We were born Muslims. We were born into Muslim families. We didn't have that. And I reply to them very simply. I reply to all of you. Every single one of us has to choose. It doesn't matter what your family was or is. You have to choose. You have to say, am I going to surrender myself unto God or am I not? Am I going to give my life to God or am I not? Am I going to be connected or strive to be connected to the creator of the universe or am I not? And actually, once we've reached the age of reason, we have to choose. We have to make a decision. So yes, I embraced Islam. I made what seems like a radical shift 23 years ago now, just shy of my 17th birthday. I made that choice. But every single one of us has to make that choice, has to sign and affirm the covenant in this world that we had in the hereafter. There's another form of connection. It's a very modern connection in many ways. But in order to have the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to have this connection. And we've met, many of us feel like we've lost this connection. And self-help books are written about this connection. And everyone from sort of Oprah will tell us how we need this connection. It's the connection to ourselves, to our inner self. And Socrates, the great Greek, he said, know thyself. Plato, the other Greek, he said, yeah, it wasn't Socrates. This is ancient wisdom upon which the foundations of our knowledge exists to know thyself, the inner sense. And you can say, well, Sister Sarah, those Greeks and Oprah and the whole modern stuff, you know, we're Muslims. But even the Prophet wasallam, said, whoever knows himself knows his Lord. It's the fitra, the innate sense that we were actually created good, created connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, created and he is closest to us than our jugular vein. So if we can know ourselves, we can know our jugular vein. We can feel the blood pulsing in our very, very internal sense to hear our heart pacing, to breathe and know that we are alive, to think and know that the criterion of right and wrong is placed in us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know that we are literally unique to our fingerprints because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to know that we are created by Him. To know that I as an individual, me, myself, I am a creation of the Most High. You know, my iPad or your iPhone and it says, designed in California. No, it's also made in China, but it's the designed in, a, in California. It's that sense that if you know yourself and you remember that you know that you were created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So know yourself. As the Prophet said, know your Lord. 
Remember, when you look in the mirror that he is the one that created you, when you connect to your inner being and give thanks for every breath, you connect to yourself, to your inner wants and thoughts, hopes, aspirations, realization, self-actualization. Know that you're a creation of your Lord. You connect to yourself, you connect to Him. You have to be honest. And it's the voice of doubt. When we say in the Surah An-Nas to seek refuge from the whisperer, we say that Surah all the time, how He whispers into our hearts. But that's all He can do, He whispers. Often he whispers that self-doubt. You can't do it. You're not capable. Who do you think you are? What is this business you think you're gonna change the world? You think you're gonna do good? Who are you? You can do nothing. <laughs> Connection's been lost to God since, since the beginning, since I. I tempted you. He whispers into the hearts of men. But if we know ourselves and we know that we seek refuge from this, we know our weaknesses and we know that remembrance of Allah, verily in the remembrance of Allah does the heart find rest. We reestablish our sense of connectivity. We have to have a certain intellectual honesty when we do this. We have to know our faults. We have to be aware of our weaknesses and seek protection from them. And it's really important that we connect to our reason. The Quran is dedicated to people who think. People who think. Not just people who believe, not just people who've got blind faith, but you think, you use your brain. And in order to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to be connected to our reason, to our intellectual capacity. There's a session later on, on the stagnation of intellectual thought. How we really have not engaged with modernity that we haven't really thought about. We haven't really thought. We've stopped thinking. We've closed the doors of ishtihad, of reasoning. Perhaps because we're scared. Oh wow, this modernity, it looks pretty scary. It's definitely making us disconnect from God. Let's blame it on technology. Let's blame it on modernity. Let's blame it on this thing they call progress. Let's retreat into ourselves. But that is not the way, because the Quran is dedicated to people who think, and the Quran asks to look around, to see his signs. And the word ayat, the word for a verse of the Quran, signs are also the signs in nature. So when people say, yeah, well, I want to do Islamic studies, I want to connect with my traditions and my knowledge, proper knowledge. Don't want any of this modern knowledge. That'll disconnect me from God. Actually, that was not the way of the early Muslims. They were freed from the suspicion and superstition and they were connected to reason and to thinking and told to explore and look around. And there they would connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now we take our traditions and we've turned our traditions into an ideology of traditionalism. And we've said, don't ask questions. Our kids come up to us and they come up with these difficult questions. My kids are always coming up with difficult questions. You know, a son aged six. Can God destroy himself? I'm like, uh. 
So they ask these really complicated questions. But our response is often astaghfirullah. You shouldn't be asking such questions. Just, just have faith. Astaghfirullah, what is this question? Where'd you hear this from? But actually, why not? Why do we not allow the connection to the mind to think about the world? To explore these ideas, for verily Allah is in his creation in the sense that he has, they are his signs that he exists. They testify that he exists. So if we explore these things, we will find him. It's also our connection to the objectives of faith. What's the point to all of this? You know, you've got this faith and you've got to do this thing and do that thing and don't do this and don't do that. A lot of do's and don'ts. But what are the objectives, the maqasid of what we actually have to do? Quran says be just. But justice is the closest thing to God consciousness. Justice is an objective of what we do. If we disconnect from justice, we're disconnecting from the ability to be closest to God consciousness. Disconnecting from wisdom, from common sense. You know what they say, there's nothing so co uncommon as common sense. From the promotion of good and the forbidding of evil. And when we disconnect from mercy, subhanallah, how we disconnect from mercy, how we disconnect from seeing another person struggling, struggling with their faith. Let's sideline them. We see somebody struggling with their life. They did it to themselves. They made their bed, they can lie in it. That person's well far away from the dean. Let's not have anything to do with them. <gasps> My goodness, what have you done, son? What will the neighbors say? Can't show you any mercy in your hour of need. Can't possibly admit. Have to be firm, have to hold firm. Where is the kindness? We say everything, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the kind. But we disconnect from the objective of establishing mercy. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is described as a mercy onto mankind. But the kafir and the gora, what do the gora know? Where is the mercy to our neighbors? When I first became a Muslim, I decided, but I wasn't, I hadn't actually taken, I hadn't gone to the masjid yet and taken shahada. And I was there with a mulvi sahab and he said to me, uh, sh take the shahada right now. I, inside I was a Muslim. I was praying, I was fasting, I was a Muslim. But I hadn't actually just gone and signed a piece of paper at the masjid. He says, you must go. I said, look, it's going to be a bit of a shock to my mother. And uh, she's in America right now, and I want her to come over. When she comes, we'll go to the mosque together. I want her to feel part of this. And he says, what are you worrying about your mother for? She's going to burn in hell anyway. And then he went on to describe hell for her. She's going to stand on her head. And the fire is going to be so hot that the skin's going to peel off. But don't worry, it's going to grow back so it can burn off again. I left his place, and the person who had taken me, I said, could you just take me to the local church, my church, please? I had left the church. But by God, I needed to go to a church. 
And when I was there, I lit a candle for her soul, because that's what we do. That's what I did. And I lit her a candle, and I said to God, just please, look after her soul. And I came back home, and I didn't have a Quran at home, but I had a Bible, and I prayed, and I was pretty much sobbing. But I was still committed to Islam, subhanAllah. And I opened up the Bible, and there was in a verse, black and white, all people should be judged with fairness and equity. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna leave my mom and I'm gonna leave everybody to Allah, to their judgment to him. And I'm gonna get on with the business of compassion and mercy in this world. Because it's not our place to go around condemning this person and condemning that person. And we have Hadith Qudsi very clear. When we say, oh, that person won't go to heaven, that person will go to hell. Allah said, who said that? Verily, I will take that person and place them in heaven. And who said that I have no mercy and I compassion? I will cast him into hell. Our connection to mercy is our connection to the Prophet ﷺ because he came as a mercy to mankind, not as a mercy to the Muslims. It's not, hey, here's a little clique. Here's the chosen people. We've got our ticket to paradise. Thank you very much, God. I'll be uh, entering paradise. It's not like living Islam. You buy your ticket, yeah, enter in. No, we get there because Allah is merciful. He gives us his mercy. It's not through our deeds. And the Prophet ﷺ went to Taif and they ran him out of town, throwing stones at him, breaking his tooth. Angel Jibreel came to him السلام, and said, I will bring down the mountains on these people. He was so merciful. He just wanted to give the words. He just wanted to talk to the people. And for one righteous person that may be in that place, he protected the people. And his greatest concern was, have I given the message? Have I done enough? Rasulullah sallallahu have I done enough to give the message to the people? Of course he had. He was a mercy and he just wanted to make sure that he had given the message to the people. But yet, do we connect to the people? Do we really connect to society? Or are there these kind of like strange things, these people that we meet at work outside the school gate? Occasionally bump into them in the supermarket. And then I love this. People come up to me and they say, Sister Sarah, why are you always talking about engaging? Islam came as a stranger, and it will leave as a stranger. Yes, my brother and sister, but we're not strange. Islam is not strange. You say, well, we believe in Allah. Mm, yes, Allah, I love this. I use the word God, I use the word of God a lot, because I'm talking in English. So I figure I'm talking in English, the English word for God is God. But they say, no, sister, you should say Allah. We believe in Allah, as if Allah is somehow distinct from God. SubhanAllah, when I was in Australia last week, I had this little girl come up to me, she must have been about 11, and she asked me the most profound question I've been asked in 23 years. And I've been asked a lot of questions. She said, Sister Sarah, when you used to pray as a Christian, and now you pray as a Muslim, did it feel like you are praying to the same God? I said, yes, my darling. Of course it does. There is only one God. The word Allah Al Ilah is just the definitive article. Al the Ilah God, the God. If I was an Arab Christian or an Arab Jew speaking in Arabic and I wanted to reference God, the Creator of the universe, I would use Allah. 
but we want to make Islam strange. And we've actually got a country, Malaysia, that wanted to ban Christians from using the word Allah. I thought it was very strange, because in Arabia, if they were Christians, they would use Allah. But we want to make ourselves different. We want to show our connection to our faith and how it's different from you over there with your faiths. Even though the Quran says, this is nothing new. And the Prophet says, I have brought nothing new. I'm just coming as a plain warner, a reminder. People come up to me, they say, Sister Sarah, why didn't you change your name to a Muslim name? I'm like, well, what's a Muslim name? Was Umar, with his sword in hand, on his way to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Was Umar a Muslim name then at that point? Was Sumaya, when she was telling her son, beseeching her son to come away from this new fangled stuff that was going to tear Arabia to pieces, was Sumaya a Muslim name then? Was Khalid, when Khalid bin Walid was on the battlefield against the Muslims, Oh, was Khalid a Muslim name then? Or Hind, when she ordered the killing of the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ordered the killing of Hamza, and then ate his liver. Oh, was Hind a Muslim name then? What's a Muslim name? It's any name that has a good meaning. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed the names of people who had bad meaning. Otherwise, he left them. My name has a good meaning. Or our clothes. I'll never forget when I was wearing a black abaya, going to my grandmother's house. I adored my grandmother, and she adored me. And she looked at me, and she wept. She said, you look like a foreigner, a stranger. It took me a while to realize that I didn't have to wear shalwa kameez and I didn't have to wear, you know, clothes that didn't belong to my family's history and culture as long as I fulfilled the requirements of cover. Islam always indigenized. It always, always connected to the local people. When, and we did a whole issue on Islam in China for Amel, when those Muslims went to China within 80 years of Hijra, they did not go and build palm leaf mosques in China. They went and they married local people, they wore local clothes, and they had pagoda-style mosques in China within 80 years of Hijra, pagoda-style. With all the little elements that you would expect on a Chinese temple. Of course, they took away the imagery that was not acceptable. But they indigenized. And that's why, when you look around the world, mashallah, you see sisters in Nigeria with their beautiful, beautiful fabric, batik fabrics in their turban, hijabs, from Malaysia, from Turkmenistan, from China. And we're here in Britain. And these are our people. And to every people has been sent prophets and then sent people who will remind them of the oneness of God and the prophetic message to be good onto others. But our connection is lost to our ability to connect to the people whom we isolate from in that other religion of isolationism. And we forget how our neighbor is 40 people in front and 40 people to our right 
and 40 people to our left and 40 people behind. Communities. And our connection to our planet. Connection to the people and our connection to the planet. To animals. You know, everything's got to be halal, they tell me. Halal, sister. <laughs> That's the stuff. What does halal mean, by the way? Uh, allowed. So, am I allowed to take a chicken? It's a question. And put it in a cage the size of this piece of paper. And let it live with its wings very tight and its beak's been burned off so it doesn't peck itself. To lay me eggs that I can get in my halal butcher. Mashallah, 30 eggs for $1.99. There's a price to pay for those eggs. You may not be paying it, but the chicken is. <laughs> but we've disconnected. Everybody tells me, sister, unstunned meat. So when I go to my butcher and I buy the chicken, I put a turkey and they cut the wings off. And I said, why are the wings missing? And he said, um, oh, it's, uh, it's an unstunned chicken, sister. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm not getting the point. He says, well, they flap around so much that the wings break off, so we have to cut them. You want me to eat an animal that has died in agony, terrified out of its wits? Is that being connected? We need to ask questions about the things we take for granted. We need to ask questions about the food that we consume about the water that we use. The Quran tells us, have you not considered the water that you drink and how we waste it? To utilize the planet, it's, it's not ours. We don't own it. It's an amana, a trust, and we are the stewards. And we have to engage and be connected to the needs of this planet and live in a sustainable way, because the way we live cannot be sustained. The way we live is not tayyab, is not wholesome. And we need to think about our connections to our planet, to our connections to God. And our connections to our responsibilities. We saw the Quran that was read before, this life is a test. Do we think that we'll just say we believe and we won't be tested? <coughs> it is a test, but we need to have that sense of responsibility. I'm going to tell you a story, a very short story. There was a king, and he says to his people, my people, I want to build for you a garden. It'll be a beautiful garden, my people. We will have trees which will give shade where we can rest in the high sun. And we will have a boating lake where we can row out and paddle with water features where we can remember the gardens under which rivers flow in the Jannah. And we will have football fields for the children to play on. And food stalls where we can buy ice creams on a hot day. Oh, my people, it's going to be beautiful. But there's not enough money in the kitty. But my people, I want you to all come together and each of you to give just one silver coin. And if you do this, if each of every one of you gives this one silver coin, we will have enough money to build this garden. What do you think? Do you agree? <gasps> yes, we do. 
replied the people. We accept. This is wonderful. And they chattered to themselves about how beautiful this garden was going to be and how they were going to enjoy it. And some of them boasted, I will give a gold coin. I will give two gold coins. What a fine garden it's going to be. And the people were excited. And the king said, here is a giant urn. Put in your gold coins, put in your silver coins. And in a month, I'll give you a month to get the money together. We will crack it open, and then we will begin work on the garden. So the people went away. Now there was a man amongst the people, and he said to himself, oh, I want this garden. It's so wonderful. We're going to play. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to take my family. But money's a bit tight at the moment. Can't really afford a silver coin. But everyone's going to give a silver coin. How can I be the only one that doesn't participate? The shame. People will tell me that I'm selfish. I know. I just can't give at this moment in time. The king would understand if I could talk to him. I'll pop in a pebble into the urn. That way, no one will know that I'm not the one to give. And when the urn is cracked open, and there's this wonderful, wonderful pile of silver coins to build the garden. Who's going to see my little pebble? So in he popped a pebble. And the king came a month later, and all the people were gathered, and there was festival and great spirits and flag waving and cheering. And the king asked his most trusted servant to crack open the urn in order to celebrate and count the silver. And with a giant hammer, he cracked open the urn and out fell thousands of pebbles. Everyone had not connected to their responsibility. Everyone had thought somebody else will do the job. Everyone else had thought that money was tight, but they needn't worry because other people will do it. If we want to be connected to Allah, then we have to have a constant conversation with him. If we wanted to be connected to Allah, we have to make dua, we have to take our salah seriously, we have to do the things that we should be doing. But Ramadan is coming up, an opportunity to connect. But unless we take on the responsibility that us as vicegerents and people who believe, believe in God and that we will face judgment for our actions, if we are only prepared to isolate ourselves and to stick a pebble in the pot, how do we expect to build a garden? How do we expect to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Verily, unless we sort ourselves out, unless we connect to our responsibilities and to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be the losers. We will have nothing but a pile of pebbles to account on the final days. And we will build nothing in this world. Jazakallah khair for your time and your attention. Anything I've said of any good is from Allah. The mistakes, they are mine. Salaam alaikum. <laughs>